By the end of this video, you'll be able to build complete battery packs, which will be able to power all of your power demanding projects. I will be building a high current battery pack with 20 Samsung 21700 lithium ion cells. The battery pack will have all of the necessary features and protections in place, with an added bonus of Bluetooth. With the Bluetooth app, you'll be able to check the battery voltage, temperatures, both input and output currents, as well as program custom values to the pack to make it super safe while taking advantage of all of its power. I will be showing the complete process, and this includes choosing the raw battery cells, making series and parallel connections, and also adding a battery management system which will balance the cells while also making sure that nothing goes wrong to make your battery safe and last as long as possible. In the previous video I upgraded my electric skateboard with some new spicy motors. The only thing that still needs upgrading is the battery, since I used cheap cells, it had a lot of cycles and I did actually discharge it too much a couple of times. The guys over at Secure sent me their brand new capacitor based spot welder, so I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to show you how these battery packs are built. I will be using Samsung 50S lithium ion cells, some 3D printed spacers to keep everything aligned, and to top it off, I'll be installing a special JDB BMS, which has built in Bluetooth that will allow us to configure the battery pack and keep it running as long as possible. The first step when building a battery pack is to make a list of your requirements. This will be your battery voltage, capacity, output current, charge current, and most important of all, size. It would be a shame to build a huge battery pack if you just don't have the space to install it into. Let's take a look at my case. I will be powering my electric skateboard, and here we have two crucial components. They are the brushless motors and the main speed controller, which takes input from my handheld remote and spins the wheels. The first thing to look into is definitely the voltage, and the input voltage of my controller goes up to 60 volts. Now let's confirm the maximum voltage of my motors, and this comes to 12S. Now here we have two different values, one is displayed in volts, and the other one in an S number. It simply means how many cells are connected together in series inside a battery pack. A series connection adds the voltage, so this number will help us calculate the maximum input voltage of my motors. When we take two battery cells, we have the option to connect them either in series or in parallel. Series connection adds the voltage, while parallel connections give us the sum of the capacity and input and output currents. The most common cells we'll be working with are lithium ion and lithium polymer cells. Both of these cells, when fully charged, will have a voltage of 4.2 volts, so a 12S battery will then have 12 times 4.2 volts, which is 50.4 volts in total. Now we know that my motors can take 50 volts, while the controller can handle a bit more. Since all of my previous builds were based on 10S, and since I already have some 10S chargers laying around, I will be building a 10S battery pack again. With the voltage figured out, the next step would be a combination of output current, price, and size. I chose Samsung 50S cells since I got a pretty good deal on them. Each cell has a capacity of 5000 mAh, and since I have enough space inside my enclosure, I will be connecting two of these in parallel as well to give me double the capacity, which will be 10,000 mAh or 10 amp hours in the end. We got most of the things figured out, but now comes a crucial part when building a battery for high power systems. These motors combined can output 5 kW of power, but on a skateboard this just doesn't make any sense. I always limit my motor currents anyway, so I will be opting for a smaller current. Most high current 21700 cells will come with an output current rating of 30 to 45 amps, and these cells can output around 40 amps peak. Connecting them in parallel will also double the output current, so this battery will be able to put out around 80 amps at 42 volts, which will give us a maximum power output of around 3.3 kilowatts while the battery is fully charged. One more thing you may look into is the charge current. It is very important that you don't charge these cells too fast, because they can overheat and eventually catch on fire. The datasheet for my cells says that it's recommended to charge them at 2.5 amps per cell, and for my 2P build, this would result in a maximum charge current of 5 amps for the whole pack. The BFS charger I own comes with an output current of 3 amps, so this will be perfectly fine. After choosing the cells, I know that I will need 20 Samsung 50S cells to build my 10S 2P battery pack. To make this battery system complete though, we will need a couple of more things, so let's quickly go over them. Let me introduce the star of today's show, my new JDB BMS. This can handle up to 70 cells in series, and they also configure the cell count automatically after you connect it to a battery pack. The most basic version comes with a price of just around 16 euros, and they have built-in Bluetooth, which will allow you to configure a ton of options, while also showing you the battery SOC, all of the cell voltages, both output and input currents, and the current battery charge percentage. The BMS I'm going to be using today is rated for 60 amps. 
but can handle a 120 amp peak and it didn't cost me more than 30 euros. I will show you how to set it up later in the video and I would definitely recommend you picking up one of these because they are truly amazing. To connect the battery cells together, you're going to need some kind of a battery spot welder. There are many options on AliExpress, but for today's build, I got a brand new spot welder from Secure. Its main advantage is that it's a capacitor-based spot welder, which means that it will be able to weld really thick metal. There is no waiting time between the welds and there are many options you can change to fine-tune your welds and get consistent results. The option of time delay, for example, is crucial to prevent sparks when welding and is one of the features you won't get with a cheap alternative. It came with a ton of accessories like a foot pedal, spare welding tips, different handles for welding and even two different power supplies. There's a ton of unboxing videos on YouTube, so I decided to skip this part for now and in this video I'll be focusing strictly on the welder settings since that's the part most people didn't even mention. The welder will be used to connect the cells together and to do so you can use pure nickel strips or copper strips. I will be using pure nickel strips since they are easier to weld and for them the thing you should care about is the maximum current rating. The most logical thing would be to go with a thicker strip since they can handle more current but you will have trouble welding them because they require a lot of energy and these welds get super hot close to soldering temps, so I would recommend you to stick with 0.15 or 0.2mm thick strips. For the width, you can go as wide as long as everything fits, but today I have some 0.15 by 10mm strips and I will be using those. With the main things out of the way, let's quickly go over some accessories which are cheap but will make your life that much easier. These stickers act as double isolation for the battery and I would definitely recommend you use them since they are super cheap. To keep the cells in place you can also get some battery spacers, but I designed both of these myself so I won't be using them today. To cover the battery cells and make it a complete battery pack you will need some heat shrink. And for the size you will have to measure your battery and see which size you need. For the main power leads you will need some high current wire. I will be using some 12 gauge silicon wire which will be able to handle my current without any problems. The last piece of the puzzle is your main power connector which will be used to connect this battery to a load. In my case it's an XT90 connector but it can be anything that fits your case. To finish the pack I will be installing a small barrel connector as well so I can hook it up to my charger. All of the required parts will be linked down below and if you're enjoying this video so far maybe consider subscribing to the channel. I'll start the build by installing the protection stickers I mentioned earlier. These go on the positive terminals of each cell to prevent shorts if a nickel strip or a tool were to touch both terminals. Once the stickers are in place I'll align the cells using my custom 3D printed spacers. They are held together with hot glue and will keep the cells in place while also keeping them isolated. Once everything was glued together, I used duct tape for added rigidity. And I also marked all of the connections so it would be easier to follow in the video. With one half done, I'll quickly prepare the other one too. Now comes the fun part, and it's spot welding. This will be a 10S 2P battery pack, and I'll start with the parallel connections. Before you connect the cells in parallel, it is very important that they are all charged to the same voltage because if they aren't, there is a chance that one cell could dump a ton of current into the other one and that could cause overheating and expansion of the cell. You can see that I put a total of 3 welds on each terminal, and from experience this was always enough. It was super handy having all of the nickel strips already cut to size, so I encourage you to do the same because it will make the job a lot easier. I already mentioned that I will be welding multiple strips on top of each other so they can handle more current, and in this case I did 2 strips for the parallel connections. Once all parallel connections were done, I took my multimeter again to check all of the cell voltages and since everything was fine I was ready to continue with the rest of the build. There's one thing I didn't cover, and it is the welder settings. The secure welder I used in this video has two pulses and an interval option. The first pulse lightly secures the strip to the battery, and the other one welds it fully in place. This is done to reduce the resistance and avoid burning through the strips. When tuned right, it can also reduce sparks when welding, but for this you also need to keep your welding tips clean by lightly sanding them when they get dirty. Now comes the tricky part, and it's the series connections. At this step, it is very easy to short something out, so be very careful and always double check everything before putting a strip on a new connection. Here you can see that the series connections follow my markings on the tape. You can see how everything looks here and at this point I had 3 strips on each series connection, but I will be adding more later. Before doing so, I wanted to confirm the battery voltage. I measured each cell from the main negative connection and as you can see, all of the cell voltages are present and correct. My final strip count was 2 strips for parallel connections and 4 strips for the series connections. 
Once both of the halves of my battery were welded, it was time to connect them together into one large battery. This is a bit weird configuration, but I chose to go this way because of my enclosure shape. My 3D printed spacer goes in between the two halves and you can see how the battery will look in the end. I'll take my multimeter one more time to measure the whole battery voltage to confirm if I did everything right. Now I will start wiring the BMS. First of all, I removed the discharge wires since they were too short and so I will be adding new ones. I accidentally overvolted my secure iron, so sadly for this video I was stuck using my TS100, which definitely lacked the power that my secure iron had. You can see how useful the holes in my spacer got here. I was easily able to route all of the wires to their place. Since this BMS does the cell count automatically, there is a pretty specific wiring schematic for it. In my case, I started wiring the connector from the ground to cell 8 as usual, and then I had to connect cell 9 to all of these wires, and then the last wire from the connector goes to the positive side of my battery pack. I did connect it wrong the first time, so take your time to get to know the schematic a bit better. I connected everything without trimming the wires first, so I can confirm all of my connections. I also got the thick 12 gauge wire and connected the main power leads. At this point everything was connected and I immediately took my phone to check the BMS app. The cell count was correct and all of the cell voltages looked right. So the next step was to make it pretty. I took some time to shorten all of the wires and I used some cable ties to keep them together. In the end it turned out really clean. I took some tape again to cover all of the exposed connections and I added an XT30 connector so I can connect the BMS to my charging port on the enclosure. After that I took some hitching to cover everything. The battery turned out awesome and the last thing was to solder the XT90 connector so that I can connect this battery to my skateboard. I also added one more piece of hitching over everything just for added safety, since there will be a lot of vibrations inside my skateboard enclosure. Now comes the other fun part, and it's the BMS Bluetooth settings. I will leave a link to the official app and some alternatives in the description. When I first connected to the BMS, I went over all of the voltages again to confirm that everything was as expected. Then I went into the parameter settings and I changed the output current limits so that the BMS doesn't trip when I accelerate. Make sure you keep these values close to your real currents, because if you put a 1000 amp for the output current for example, the BMS will trigger at something much lower, like 30 amps. I did have this problem with my first battery pack. I wanted to get rid of the overcurrent protection and I set it too high. I did something like 1000 amps. After I flashed it, the BMS triggered at around 30 amps, and it took me a few days to figure out that this setting was corrupted, since I put a number that was too high. With the BMS programmed and the whole battery fully built, I wanted to show you how to charge these packs. You already know your maximum charge current, which you shall never exceed. My battery is a 10S pack and its maximum voltage is 42 volts, so we need to find a 42 volt charger for lithium ion batteries. A quick search on AliExpress will give us a ton of options, but I would encourage you to stick with a well-known brand and definitely skip the cheapest option since one of my cheap chargers legit exploded the other day. Most of these chargers will have an LED indicator that will let you know when the battery is charging and when it's fully charged. A huge advantage of the JDB BMS is that you can monitor the charge current and also see how the cell balancing is going. It will also show you your remaining charge time, which is such a huge game changer for something like this. Definitely worth the money in my opinion. The battery is fully built and now is the time to try it out. Once it was fully charged, I installed it into my enclosure and I went for a quick ride to see how it performs. Once I got on the board, I immediately noticed a huge power increase, since my old battery was sagging a lot. I also tweaked some VESC settings and now I was able to hit around 43 km an hour, which was awesome. Let me know if I missed anything and definitely don't forget to subscribe since we are so close to hitting 10k subscribers. Thank you for sticking to the end and I will see you in the next one.